second slide. This slide, uh, in fact, is more than two decades old, and I just wanted to talk about how we thought of doing point of care direction even at that point in time when that was not really uh, a concept in reality. And we started, we decided to use whatever technology was available to kind of enable such point of care detection across DNA, proteins, small molecules, et cetera, and antibodies. And this is what we talked about, doing independent care, continuous care, uh, the ability to diagnose and treat within a single visit, cost-effective care by reducing that entire cascade of tests that are required and uh, getting a gold standard diagnostic directly at point of care and using that. Most importantly, we decided to leverage mobile telephony that was also at that point in time um, already very prevalent in the country. And uh, we thought that once we were able to leverage the power of data, we could possibly do a lot more than what was being done at that point in time. That was in terms of the vision. There was also a way in which we progressed the business part of it, because that is what drives the survival of all of these uh, startup thoughts. We were funded initially by um, Kinney's, Sampath's and Guru's ability to generate funding from uh, IT businesses. And we were able to internally incubate our uh, teams because at that point in time, there was very little funding available. In fact, um, there was no venture capital funding to talk about. Even uh, the Government of India funding uh, mechanisms at that point in time for private companies was almost non-existent. So if it was not for that, um, ability to generate initial uh, money required for us to even start this journey, we would never have even begun this journey. We had multiple rounds of discussions with multiple funding agencies and ultimately they used to come back to us and say, hey, but you're a private company. How do we fund you? That was till the year 2005 when uh, the CSIR's Numitri program finally gave us a soft loan of uh, $1 million. Even that soft loan would not have happened if we did not have the ability to pay that back or at least show on paper that we had a balance sheet, we had some cash flows, etc. But what that program did for us was far beyond the money. Yes, the money was very important. It also gave us access to some really fantastic people. Uh, Professor Padmanabhan, Professor Ganguly, all of them were part of this. Uh, Professor Mohan Rao were part of our um, monitoring committee, advisory committee, etc. for Nimitli. And we did not know much. We thought that every technical victory that we had was a very major victory. Every time we did, we took one step forward, uh, whether it was with the chip, whether, whether we were running PCR or the optics or the software, we were made to feel that we've achieved something. Today, if I look back at that, that entire journey, none of those things really mean anything when you talk about the journey from an idea to a product in the market. But that positivity and that support that we got, apart from, of course, very brilliant technical uh, inputs from all of them, and also that ability to be in IASC and work with our collaborator, Professor Venkatraman, who unfortunately is no more, it was amazing. It was it was fantastic that uh, uh, that support happened at that point in time, and in many ways that was responsible for where we are. This was a five-year project. We finished that project in three years, and that was again, um, I think, among the first that a government program had uh, experienced in much lesser budget. And then we were asked to extend this for another two years and add some milestones to that. And that is where we uh, uh, took yet some more money from Nimitli and went to a product that had some clinical validation. In the journey in between, we got a private investor. In very interested, this investor was from uh, Tanzania uh, through Dr. Ayer, who was our medical director at that point in time. And he believed in us and invested a fairly large uh, amount of money at that point in time and a fairly uh, decent valuation because those things become very critical. 
we also had the ability to partner with multiple or the opportunity to partner with multiple uh, multinationals very large multinationals we did not decide to go ahead with them because we figured out that they were not really interested in the technology we did not know whether this technology would reach the market we did not know whether they were more interested in our team's abilities rather than in our vision to have this as a product in the market so when we met uh, shri ram who was at that point in time running um, the tulip diagnostics group we felt a match of wavelengths and we formed uh, molbio in the year 2011 initially as a joint venture now tulip was a very interesting company too because it was india's first uh, multinational company in the sense that at one point in time they were running they were having more than a 50% market share for hiv malaria rapid tests across the world selling to all the international agencies so they knew how to manufacture something i did not know anything about manufacturing not in my team um so very interestingly shri ram had actually formed mol bio also in the year 2000 and he had formed mol bio as the name indicates to do molecular biology but he did not find the right kind of partners or technologies to work with so it was actually something waiting to happen if you look at it and then in the year 2015 we merged these companies in the year 2020 we got funded by motilal oswal private equity which was our first private equity investment in the space and uh, that's been a snapshot of our journey here in between this is what we were doing technically in the year 2005 was the first time we had some kind of a prototype that we could even show somebody this was pre funding by anybody before that i first tried to have a team a team that understood biology chemistry uh, and engineering and worked together and we did a few mistakes we actually started with the mem space glucose sensor and amperometric sensor ran into a lot of difficulty uh, in terms of how do you make it Uh, we worked with SEL Chandigarh at that time. Together went to DBT. DBT uh, and SEL wanted a large amount of money to do some MEMS uh, foundry uh, from DBT, and DBT threw both of us out. They said, "Why does SEL require money from DBT?" By that time, we also figured out that uh, our entire concept of the design was wrong because we were in a position to very accurately measure glucose. At least that is what the vision was. in blood in whole blood and very quickly but we had no way to action that information in real life, in, in in the real world uh, glucose measurements in the body vary fairly dramatically and the technology used the glucose strips also produce uh, about 10% variance which is completely accepted because it doesn't matter unless you are going to action that with something like an insulin pump so we kind of pivoted from there at that point in time and decided that we don't want to go after uh, glucose sensing and other such parameters we decided to focus on infectious diseases and pcr was the technique that all of us had uh, in the lab worked on i personally had worked on it when i was doing some work on recombinant uh, human insulin at the vital malaria research foundation and i found that a very fascinating technique as an engineer a technique that has very high sensitivity and very high specificity at the same time uh, offered by the uniqueness of the chemistry that went to that so uh, we felt that if we were able to somehow take this technology to the masses uh, we would possibly do a good job of diagnosing infections so we created a small ltcc chip in the lab and uh, we had some degree of thermal cycling this actually could do uh, dna amplification it is based on that that csr decided to fund us and then year on year we kept on adding the capability of the platform uh, first in terms of thermal cycling then in terms of optical measurements using optical fibers then using more conventional optics till version number 8 is what was our first product in the market in the year 2013 actually that is 2011 is when we had this prototype but then we did not know anything about design for manufacturing so we had to re-engineer the entire thing for manufacturability we had to redefine what is the new product introduction process we did not do any of these things 
So we had uh, Dr. Farooq Kadri from the US who spent a lot of time with us at that, that time to work with the Indian ecosystem. And the beauty is that almost everything was made locally, except for the chip. The LTCC chip at that point in time, I started my work with CMET in Pune, but we were not able to produce any consistent chip. And because of a wide variation in the chip itself, I was not able to use this to do any reliable data generation. So we went to EPFL and other foundries outside India. And at one point in time, I was paying 27 euro per chip. And people used to laugh at me saying that this guy is talking about point of care detection. And this is the kind of money that we are paying for the chip. But um, the Nimitli uh, um, group was very supportive. And we were able to convince them that if this was done at scale, this could be done at really low cost. Very interestingly, in 2008, 2009, when we started looking at clinical samples to run this, that was the first time that we started thinking of sample preparation. Till then, if somebody used to talk to me about sample preparation, I used to get irritated because uh, I thought that they were taking away from my group's um, technical success. But you can't uh, run this of biological samples unless you can prepare them. So then we started looking at a couple of parallel methods. We first worked on magnetic nanoparticles. We used to initially source them from Merck, but then they were so expensive that uh, that could not be commercial. So we created our own magnetic nanoparticles, uh, characterized them, coated them, characterized the coating, developed the chemistry, and took out the first version in the market in around 2013. That was about the time that we started looking at um, tuberculosis detection. And uh, we had very strong support from uh, Dr. Soumya Swaminathan, who was the director uh, of the uh, Tuberculosis Research Institute in Chennai at that time, and Dr. Katoch, who was the director general of ICMR at that time. In fact, without their very strong motivation, I doubt whether we would have got into TB. Because preparation of a blood sample is very different than preparation of a sputum sample. And Nobody wanted to work with the sputum sample. That was the time we had a very small lab in IISC, and we did not even have enough biosafety to work with some of these TB samples. Luckily, at that time, we were able to move out and move into uh, a much better uh, infrastructure at uh, Rajaji Nagar and start working on uh, the sample preparation of sputum samples. We started working on an automated way of doing this. So we moved from ma magnetic nanoparticles to magnetic nano nanofibers, no, not magnetic, to nanofibers, and started using that as a method for DNA extraction, and then do the PCR. Ultimately, we have this PCR box that you will see for later in the presentation. This journey has had so many different uh, collaborations, so many different opportunities that we were exposed to. Uh, Grand Challenges Canada was a very major supporter uh, in our sample prep uh, endeavor. Gates Foundation constantly kind of had, we had the opportunity to see what was happening as uh, the uh, standard of uh, activities in this area, all of them leading to our journey. So today, this is where we are. We are the only commercially available real-time PCR platform that is um deployable in resource limited settings and this is worldwide even today uh we are of course following on the footsteps of cephid uh which lost the launched that problem server platform in 2005 and in response to what i think we were doing wanted to launch something like omni uh, called omni which would also do point of care detection which they have now decided not to pursue so point of care detection for um, infectious diseases is still uh, does still pose a lot of problems in spite of the uh, uh, the developments that have happened during the covid regime uh, we have seen a lot of lamp based technologies out there and a lot of technology acceleration but there are uh, significant challenges to do uh, detection at point of care this is our platform. You can, this is a, a, the TrueLab Uno, and you can carry this in a suitcase uh, along with our sample prep device. This, in fact, this suitcase is all you require to do PCR. And if you have this, you can run, uh, open it up anywhere, even under a tree, literally, and run the PCR. 
the point of care platform. It's portable, rapid, it is battery operated. And um, this is the sample prep platform today. This is the true prep auto. This cartridge and the development of this cartridge uh, made a lot of my team um, very old uh, men because of the men and women because of the complexity in converting what we thought was a fairly simple uh, method to use fluidics to do sample preparation. Yes, getting that injection molding of those two plates to the precision that you require, to the flatness that you require, bonding them using uh, appropriate technology, seeing that it doesn't leak, <coughs> and having these uh, run in, a, in an automated fashion has been a massive challenge. But the beauty is that this is a prep system that can take any sample. It can take any biological sample, however complex, use the same set of reagents and produce high quality nucleic acids at the end of uh, the prep. And the prep takes less than 18 minutes today. It's a battery operated prep. Uh, all you need to do is to load the sample. Now, because we were a point of care system, that's what we wanted to be at least. Uh, we had to ensure that all the pathogens were inactivated immediately on contact with our buffers. Because we did not have access to biosafety, or we did not expect access to biosafety. So those are some of the things that we started working right from the very beginning. And it has proved to be so immensely useful in situations like Nipah, COVID, etc., where you're, the moment your sample is collected, your virus is lysed. We have done this even for TB, and this data was part of the WHO uh, process, where even the uh, very strong cell wall of MTB is lysed, and it's completely not possible for MTB to spread once you have the buffer in the sample. It makes it absolutely safe for the technician. This was a very important uh, part of our entire development, I believe. So you have the cartridge and the prep system, and then you have this uh, low temperature co-fired ceramic chip. Uh, this is a chip that we are now uh, making in millions, and uh, this has a smart memory chip also uh, on a very simple PCB. And uh, the entire uh, lot-related information as well as standard curve is on this chip. We have four versions of the device. Uh, the fourth version is not on, on the picture. It's the Tula Buno is your single test system that does about eight to 12 samples in an eight hour shift. Uh, the PCR run takes less than 35 minutes. This is the duo, it's completely random access. You could run TB, for example, in one and you could run COVID on the other. This is a four base system, again, completely random access. And now we have a 16 base system that is being used at some of the airports in the country. All of these systems are connected, and it potentially has the ability to do a lot of things. But data is not something that public health care understands very well today, and there are a lot of restrictions being put in. Without understanding that a point of care system requires to be monitored, so we have a heartbeat that we can pick up any time a device is switched on. So if a device is not switched on for a period of time, we are able to proactively go and find out why that device is not even switched on. Is it that the technician is not available or is it that there is a problem with the device? If there is any problem with the device, we are able to remotely identify that before it is reported to us. And some of those are very important uh, parts when you're considering uh, very large field level deployments as we are seeing today. But the data, the power of the data is already being used. We can already uh, directly integrate into systems like NICSHARE, which is the central DB division's portal for collection of this data. Um, also with other international agencies where we are um, currently deploying and have that patient data directly pushed into uh, the central repository of the program. And I'll talk about a very interesting aspect of data a little later in this uh, talk. Today, we have more than uh, 35 diseases that we can test on this platform. And uh, many of them are diseases of uh, immense public health. Uh, for example, we were able to work with NIV and diagnose Nipah in Kerala. 
both for the first uh, wave and then subsequently for the second wave. And this is the only test in the country today that is uh, uh, approved by the Drug Controller General of India for test for NEPA. The advantage is that the sample does not have to go to NIV Pune. So if somebody has fever under those circumstances, and this is a fatal disease essentially, you are able to very quickly put that person at rest saying that he does not have NEPA. That itself, I think, is of immense value. Or if we ask NEPA, we are in a position to possibly uh, uh, isolate him, quarantine him, and uh, treat him to the best of the system of the medical uh, system's capabilities. Similarly, for COVID or many of the other diseases that we work on, we have hepatitis C viral load that is now uh, being implemented programmatically. We have the uh, human papilloma virus, high risk. Uh, um, Variants that we are able to look at this, we have STDs, of course, we have TB, and um, we are at any point in time at R&D working on at least adding 40 more diseases to this platform. Already, I believe we have a very comprehensive set of essays. This is possibly among the only problem uh, platforms with this kind of a range of essays available worldwide. This is what we've been able to do, transform the ability you do molecular diagnostics from a lab like this in the top uh, screen, this part, to something like this. Now, this is one of the, uh, uh, the designated microscopy centers of the government of India in one of the rural areas. The infrastructure is completely not there, and we don't need it. This is a makeshift table that we are running our device on. No AC, no deep freezer minimal biosafety requirements, and people who were formerly smear microscopy technicians are now running molecular diagnostic tests. There have been a lot of questions about whether this was possible, but today we have done more than 20 million tests on our platform. It's not a small number. This TB journey has been something that has completely transformed us as a team. When we started working on TB, we did not know what we were getting into. We did not even know the impact of what we could do, uh, what was the impact, uh, where uh, we were with TB. Many of us thought that even though we were people in this area, we thought that TB is not a, a disease that you hear of very often. Till we were confronted with statistics that we have, we are losing a patient a minute to TB. That is not the case with COVID, but it does not get talked about. And the amount of uh, neglect that the DB patients have faced over the last two years in COVID have seriously set us back possibly. And we will have to work doubly hard to try and see what we can do to eliminate DB uh, by 2025, which is the uh, very ambitious goal that our prime minister has set for ourselves. It can be done. But a lot of work would have to happen because of uh, possibly the setbacks because of COVID. We approached ICMR with this platform. We got a lot of feedback from them. We modified the platform. We modified the prep. We modified the ability to have multiple channels on our uh, PCR device. Did both TB screening as well as and resistance over five years. And we had a large amount of data that showed that, yes, this device works as well as the gold standards, possibly even better. It was compared to a gene expert. It was compared to culture, to LPA. And a composite reference standard was set up, including patient x-rays. Uh, the discordants were analyzed by sequencing, uh, by follow-up uh, treatment. So it was a massive effort. Uh, by ICMR for validating a platform like this for TB. And this letter is something that I value a lot because this is the first time that the expert committee on TB that ICMR had set up saw our data and uh, said that this is something that we should introduce into the national program. Around that time, uh, we heard that the PMO was interested in doing a large field study 
and I actually happened to meet uh, the uh, officer in charge from the PMO who was driving this study. And that vision of working on something like TB and eliminating uh, this using an Indian innovation is something that I personally very strongly, uh, it, has a, it is definitely something that has had a very strong impact on me that yes, these kind of things are being looked at at the highest level. So we were asked to do a field study and normally a field study is a field study. We were asked to do a field study over 100 sites. 10 states in the country, one at a high load center, which is the district headquarters, one at a low load center, which was a peripheral site, which is a, a, a sphere microscopy center. And this data was to be uh, generated by the sphere microscopy technicians to see whether it was feasible to run. The experiences from that field study are amazing. We had a situation where in some sites, the devices were washed off because of flash floods. We had devices in the middle of the jungle. We had devices at 45 degrees, 47 degrees centigrade. We had devices at like 6 degrees centigrade. All of this data was generated, but the beauty was the data was going real time into uh, our servers and we were able to share that data with the program and for the first time the program was seeing live data coming from the most remote corners of the country directly and um, subsequently of course uh, the ctd uh, the central tb division at that time did a lot of work and we uh, got an introduction into the national program but find started working with us and along with icmr to generate data, similar data across the world. Now, this was a completely different level of due diligence. And we were doing this in multiple countries across the world, Peru, Ethiopia, Papua New Guinea. Did this for both our MTB as well as our high sensitivity MTB, which is our MTB plus test, uh, ran it against uh, the Rifampicin test. And uh, the WHO recommendation was completely unambiguous, which showed that we had similar accuracy to all the other WHO approved devices uh, that were out there for TB. And this was the only point of care device that was there. These are a few pictures from um, the devices that are running today at multiple locations. Andhra was the first state that gave us the uh, break. This was even before the uh, Central TB Division's order. And this was before the WHO endorsement. When uh, the Prime Minister announced in the NTB program um, about the TrueNet uh, device, they took it upon themselves to introduce this in Andhra Pradesh. And in October of 2018, we introduced this at 225 primary health centers in Andhra Pradesh. The idea was to install, train, and manage the systems. Today, we have done up to uh, close to 750. Actually, this number is a little old. Uh, more than 750,000 patients have been screened on the TUNAC device in Andhra Pradesh. At the peak, they were doing 1,000 tests of TB per day. And then they procured a lot more machines during the COVID the pandemic. And we were. Andhra was the first state in the country to be able to scale COVID diagnostics dramatically across the state because they had. Uh, between 13 and 25 molecular diagnostic devices per district as opposed to one per district that most of the the rest of the country had we were also able to set up a dashboard live for monitoring for the Andhra Pradesh state government we were able to use uh, the GIS information to decide on device hotspots leverage the power of data and move move, move more devices into those areas so all of these things were some things that we did uh, with Andhra. The national program deployed 1,512 devices uh, in the year 2020. That is when we got our WHO approval also. And uh, they gave us an order for 1,512 devices and 4 million tests to be deployed in 2020, 2021. And right after that was when COVID epidemic hit. And all of those devices were repurposed to run COVID tests. So just before that uh, uh, clearance from ICMR for our COVID tests on the TUNAT platform, 
India had 20 authorized sites across the country. From 20, it suddenly shifted to 1,512 plus 20. The moment uh, the uh, approval came for the COVID test on our device. So we were able to really uh, provide testing at the most remote corners of the country at this point in time. Today, we are implementing the uh, platform in 14 countries. This is slightly dated um, across the globe for um, the uh, testing for both COVID and uh, for TB and as a multidisciplinary platform. This is the COVID test that was approved by ICMR, and uh, this was the COVID test that was approved by FIND. Today, as I've told you, we've done more than 20 million tests on our platform. We have more than 5,500 devices across the globe. 4,500 of those devices are in India. We are today present in 32 countries, mostly Asia, African countries, Latin American and continental American countries, and European uh, countries, a few European countries. We have scaled very rapidly during the COVID epidemic in response to a call to scale. And we moved from our current capacity, our, our capacity in the year 2020 of about 50,000 tests per day to 300,000 tests per day. We have a fully automatic facility, automated facility now in uh, Vishakhapatnam that is creating our cartridges. We have a very modern, ultra-modern facility in Goa now that uh, does our uh, test manufacture, our, our chip development, and all the logistics and shipping from this. This is where we are today. I uh, want to end by thanking everybody. The, uh, I am talking about this today, but the people behind this is essentially my team. They me for more than two decades. Most of them have come with me and stayed with me through this journey. And um, it is their work that I'm presenting. I'm just the face for this entire activity. So many partners have been involved in so many different stages of our development. I can't even think of all of them um, at one shot. Uh, they're so numerous in uh, number. The kind of support that we got from people like Dr. Atre, General Sundaram, we did not know much at that point in time. And um, we had such positive support from the entire ecosystem, the mentor ecosystem, the uh, manufacturing ecosystem, which was, I think, quite, in, quite at its infancy when we started working with them. But they've worked with us. They've understood our needs. They have helped us scale. We would not have been able to deliver the numbers that we delivered if they did not go completely berserk just like we did uh, to pull out all stops and deliver uh, when the country needed us. And this is something that I can very proudly say that they are as much part of our success as all the other people who have contributed to it. Thanks. Thank you so much for giving me such a patient patient hearing and I'm going to stop my slide sharing and I'm happy to take questions. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Nair, for a truly remarkable journey. And uh, we are really thankful to you for uh, developing this device. So now the floor is open for uh, some questions. If somebody is having question, can unmute uh, yourself and then ask. So uh, I have one question, uh, Dr. Nair. Uh, you said that initially you started with the chip manufacturing uh, from outside. So now, uh, do you manufacture the chips here also? No, unfortunately, not yet. Um, we still require to import. So is it is it because of the constraint of LTCC uh, process that you are referring? There to? is no constraint actually. It is definitely possible to do this at very large scales in the country. We are exploring that possibility, and we will definitely start setting up. We have already earmarked land for that purpose, so we are going to do this. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Any other question or comments? Yeah, Professor Suresh. Yeah. Uh... Chandi, it was really nice to hear the whole story uh, of uh, big techs and big tech and uh, Wikimino Malbio. Uh, just, I'm, I'm just wondering, you know, um, 
in terms of uh, you showed that uh, you already have presence in more than 30 countries in terms of uh, this product uh, you also see that uh, in north america and europe also like sapphire and other companies i think you must be very close to competing with them or maybe are surpassing can you just comment on that and also what are the next steps for malbio so we are seeing a lot of traction in europe Mm-hmm. And uh, not so much in North America because uh, we have not followed US FDA regulations. We mm-hmm. very extensively follow CE regulations. All our uh, uh, devices are uh, CE marked. All our tests are CE marked. Um, and uh, even for some of the uh, new IVD uh, regulations, so we are completely in tune with all of those. Um, we find a lot of opportunity. in um, places like um, india around the world and there is a huge unmet need and uh, we are starting to uh, be able to do something about this in a few countries now and uh, we have our work cut out all of these uh, places require multi disease detection while tb can be a, a driver uh, covid has shown that almost everybody requires to be tested for covid uh, especially if you have uh, maybe latent tb there is a uh, clear indication that there is a very rapid conversion from latent to active tb infection so that is why the recommendation to test if you have a continued cough after covid uh, we have uh, women's health issues we have sexual diseases transmitted diseases diseases we have so many other things that are required for public health across the world and a multi disease platform like ours has a lot of lot of role to play and a long way to go across the globe rather than uh, maybe just the us or you know yeah. thank you all the best yes. thank you professor suresh uh, uh, sai and dr sai do you want to unmute and ask question sai naga if not i'll just read it so she uh, he is asking uh, any medical device certification needed for making medical devices in india yes uh, the new regulations uh, definitely require um, medical device certifications um, some of those are voluntary but as i told you we have ce marking and uh, we subject our device to extensive test because this is not just built for india so uh, we were very clear about that and our device is a ce mark Yeah, another question to it is: uh, Does this device, TrueNet, need calibration either on daily basis or time, like on some no. schedule? No, this we have made sure that this calibration issue that was there with some of the other devices is not there for TrueNet. So we do not require calibration on a periodic basis. Okay, thank you. And another question from Doctor uh, Ganesh Babu: uh, Would you like to unmute yourself and ask uh, Doctor Ganesh? If not, I will read his question. Yeah, yeah. 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 am I audible? Yes. yes. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Nair. Uh, it was wonderful talk. Uh, uh, my question is, uh, when you when you inform us that uh, you have tested a lot of uh, blood sample samples inside the blood and ten percent variation kind of thing, uh, I was curious that is it only blood you have uh, tested or uh, you have uh, tested on various uh, other uh, uh, secretions like uh, sputum or uh, Tears or sweat or things like that. Because what we know during our time is uh, glucose is there. It is secreted not just in the blood but is also in other uh, things. Can we also do rapid test instead of breaking the blood and doing a blood glucose? Is my question. So uh, thank you for your question, sir. And uh, I am not the best person to answer that question. Primarily because I don't know how glucose correlates across all of these different sample types. at that point in time very early in our journey we were looking only at blood glucose so i don't have the answer to your question i'm sorry uh, thank you uh, dr anurekha yeah uh, good evening uh, dr nair it was really nice to hear you i lost my connection in between so maybe you might have answered a question but i would like to ask you that uh, Uh, from where are you getting the mems part of your uh, point of care device fabricated now you were talking about scl and um, at that time when i lost the connection so i would like to know that and secondly uh, secondly i am also the coordinator of the 
Kurukshetra University Technology Incubation Center. We have recently started our journey. So it was really great to hear your journey. And I would like to know, the second question is, I would like to know how much time did it take for you to um, uh, settle down in the market after you started as an incubator in ISC? So these are the two questions I would like to ask. Uh, the answer to your first question, ma'am, is we are currently still importing the uh, LTCC chip. We do not have a commercial foundry in India uh, to produce those chips at the price points that we want and the volumes that we want. And both of them are interlinked. We are currently in talks to set up an LTCC manufacturing facility at the AMTZ location where we have identified land for this already. And uh, the second part of your question is about how much time we took to, to settle in the market. I don't think we've settled in the market yet. So uh, <laughs> we, we uh, were able to show some revenues uh, from 2013, but it was a uphill battle, primarily because nobody wanted necessarily to do PCR. PCR itself was not very well known as a technique. And secondly, um, why would somebody want an expensive test unless there was a volume of evidence that was generated that that expensive test could provide you results that were not provided by the other tests. So in some sense, that WHO approval, the government of India approval for TB was a big turning point for us and an introduction into the public health program. I believe this was, this was the first time that any public health program in the country used a device that was ideated, prototyped, developed completely in India. So that was a big uh, bonus. And of course, now COVID has taught us that, okay, real-time PCR is here to stay. Thank, thank you, thanks. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Anurekha. Uh, Dr. Chan, Ramachandra. Uh, uh, Chandi, uh, good evening. Ramchandra here from yes. NDRF. Uh, I don't know if you <laughs> recall. Uh, yeah. Now, we started this fluorescence-based uh, NO detection, explosive detection, long, long term back with Janu Sundaram. Uh, Prashanti started with you, and we had a big journey. It was a short journey, though, and I'm sure you're sucked away into major, more important things than detecting explosives. But is there anything happening in that front? We, we talked about um, uh, the fluorescence-based uh, detection system to be flown in a, a small microair vehicle. And that was the uh, activity at the time, almost uh, eight years, 10 years back. Uh, is there any work going on, uh, on the peripherally uh, in your system? Yes, sir. Um, first of all, we started this uh, um, explosive detection journey with an NP mass support to uh, Professor Anil Kumar at IIT Delhi. Right. And uh, that particular product has finally seen the light of the day and it is now validated by multiple agencies across the, uh, the country. We are getting it validated by multiple agencies across the world. Right. But uh, And the product is now ready commercially. But right. at this point in time, nobody has the money to kind of invest in anything other than COVID. So right. Right. That, is, uh, uh, that is the situation. We continue to be interested in uh, not just uh, uh, explosive-based detection, but in breath-based detection, essentially, so yeah. to detect multiple uh, uh, multiple compounds in breath. And that is something that we are continuing to focus on from an R&D perspective. Really? Great. Thank you. It was a nice, nice uh, exposition uh, of your uh, major activities, uh, big journey. Thank you. It was an interesting, informative thing. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Ramchan. And uh, there's somebody from Hums Group. Uh, maybe if you would like to unmute and ask question. Yeah, Chandi, I'm Sudhakar here. Okay. Very nice to listen to you, your talk after a long time. And uh, it is a very much successful man as you are today. You are gone through a good struggle, I'm aware. And I just I would like to know, you had gone through your struggle for 20 years. Now, for the present generation students, what is your advice? What exactly they need to get prepared to become a good entrepreneur? I think that may be a good, valuable inputs that you need to give to the society. Nice to hear you after such a long time, Sudhakar. But uh, I don't know whether the students will like my answer. I find a lot of entrepreneurial activity in the country, but I find that there is a lot of activity in terms of valuations and business growth 
i don't find that intensity of purpose to grow your product technically and i think that unless your product is very strong and it can withstand uh, the changes that the market will constantly push you to uh, do i don't know how scalable something like this in the long is in the long term and this is just a word of caution there are there are amazing people out there and there there are people with so much more maturity than i had when i started this journey and this is just a word of caution that i want to kind of put out there saying that i think businesses will grow money will be made but patience is i think uh, uh, the key uh, the self belief is i think also very important but the technical uh, strength of the product i think is also very important thank you but uh, what i'm trying to uh, know from you is whether it is a technology that requires initially or with the business opportunity that requires or uh, how a student coming out from the engineering college need to place himself in a position to see around the world and they say this is the way that i need to travel uh, maybe that is the way as on today i think the market is placed so that's why uh, i am just trying to know from your experiences and say based on the present situation <laughs> how exactly you proceed you give advice to the students so we spent about 5 years trying to identify the need gap that we need to work on and then we had to make some changes and some corrections in route the beauty of today's uh, ecosystem is that all of that information is available and there is enough mentoring available up front having said that i think it is important that people continue to believe in what they want to do and sustain that activity for a period of time not everything can happen so easily we we've, we've gone through a very interesting and very uh, challenging times uh, in our own developmental journey itself and then subsequently business takes over and you wonder why did you spend so much time technical on technical stuff so having said that i still think that it is very important that your basic product has strength and you work and sustain your efforts in whatever direction you kind of take up uh, thanks uh, the professor suresh you want to ask something. yeah thanks ashok for letting me ask another uh, question uh i guess we have one minute or something uh chandi uh, i just wonder uh, you know uh, during the pandemic like every household used to have a thermometer fever thermometer now people also have a pulse oximeter most uh, households so in a similar way talking of scale up do you ever imagine in the future the rt pcr also will become a household uh, diagnostic uh, thing rather than being point of care absolutely i i completely believe that we will have a completely instrument free device that we can use at home to diagnose specific devices with the sensitivity of the rt pcr uh, i seriously believe that that is going to happen and the economy will also scale accordingly yes absolutely yeah. it will be affordable okay that's nice to hear yeah thank you uh, thank you professor suresh uh, is there any other question uh if yeah so ashwin uh, he's asking what is the cost of the instrument uh, that you built so we have three versions of the instrument the lowest cost instrument is about 6 and 1/2 lakhs today and the test is about 1000 rupees uh, any hi yeah. hi bc bindu here from psg hi <laughs> so uh, uh, i i just want to share that uh, i i am lucky to uh, get accepted as a industrial partner uh, from his side for my project so uh, i am just hoping that the project on cancer screening also you will take it to a big level <laughs> no, no i'm sure we will do our best to get yes, yes, yes. thank you so i am very happy to work uh, with the big tech team Uh, i think maybe for past 6 years i have been uh, working with them anyway so happy for uh, the growth uh, wish you much more <laughs> okay thank you all so the much. best all the best thank you so much yeah uh, thank you uh, dr bindu so if there is no question now uh, we really uh, uh, thank uh, uh, dr chandrashekhar nayar uh, for a uh, truly remarkable talk and his journey that he shared with us i hope that 
we hope that it will inspire many of us uh, to take up the uh, technical challenges and uh, like uh, do something <laughs> like this so thanks uh, dr nair for your time and sharing uh, your journey with us thanks a lot thank you dr ashok thanks to everyone yeah, thanks everyone